Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm delighted to welcome a woman who can best be described as a force of nature. Her ingenuity, creativity, charisma, and generosity of spirit have made her one of the most sought after media personalities in the entertainment world. She's a teacher, author, poet, journalist, and entrepreneur. She has two publishing companies which provide services to self-published authors. She's the senior writer and celebrity correspondent for Trendsetters to Trendsetters magazine and a frequent contributor to Women of Wealth magazine. She's the CEO and founder of Trinity Entertainment Productions, which is swiftly becoming a key player in the media industry. She co-authored a book entitled Born for This and her latest book, Between the Legs of My Thoughts, an anthology of poetic self-discovery and affirmations is tremendously inspiring and uplifting. She's a regular presence on red carpets at high profile events in the entertainment industry. She's an ordained pastor and created a foundation to fight domestic violence. And most recently, she hosts a wonderful live podcast on the Clubhouse platform called The Coffee Shop Talk with Shernita. And I'm proud to say that she's also a dear friend. She's the fabulous and irrepressible Shernita Wiggins Winder. Shernita, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Shernita, when I said you were a force of nature, I meant that in a number of ways. It's not just because of your sparkling personality and what you've achieved. It's because of where you've come from and what you've been through. Your life journey has been anything but ordinary. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I would. It, it's what, what the old folks used to say. I've seen a, a lot of muddy water on dry land. <laughs> so it, it means that, I don't know, some of the things that I've gone through, many people, and I've seen a lot of people that have gone into drugs or gone into other situations, but I, I chose to, to, to use it to kind of propel me, if you kind of understand what I'm saying. I use it as fuel or fire to give me purpose. Now, that didn't come easy. It pretty much defined me. It pretty much defined what I did or what I do. Can you share with our audience the extremely traumatic circumstances of your youth? Well, I, there was a time I really even couldn't talk about this without crying. But from the earliest age of about five till almost seven, uh, my stepfather molested me. And he used to always say that if I ever told, he would kill my mother, me and my brother, and then himself. Well, I remember finally just not wanting to go through that anymore. And, it, and, and it's amazing that I have those memories for that. But I remember telling my mom, and my, one of my biggest fear was that she wouldn't believe me. Because he said that. He said, she's not going to believe you. And when I told her, she did. And I remember we stayed off of the main highway in, in uh, Pensacola, across from a donut shop. And he frequented that area. And I remember her grabbing me by the hand and taking me across the street and going in there and telling him that if he touched me again, that she would kill him. Instead, months later, around July, in July, what I gathered from other adults in my family, she had planned to divorce him. And because of that, he opted to kill her. She, and, and the crazy thing is, is that I don't know if she felt it because earlier that day, I learned about three years ago, her best friend said that her husband had told her what his emotives were. And she told my mom and my mom said, well, he said that all the time. And evidently something clicked. When she took us home, she brought us back to that great aunt's house. And when she went back home to take a bath, he murdered her. He shot her three times in the head. And I, I, it, that was hard because I felt like it was my fault. I felt like it. And unfortunately, although I understand now, my grandmother really took that hard. And she would say sometimes, you know, if you hadn't said anything, your mama would still be here. So that was hard too. So childhood wise, it was pretty rough trying to, you know, process all of that. Shernita, it's almost unfathomable what you went through. I'm wondering if you can take us briefly through the steps you had to take to achieve peace of mind and a sense of serenity within your own soul. As a child, I have a, I'm creative. I'm an artist. I write. I love to read. So I immerse myself in books. I literally would lock myself up in my room. And for me, reading 
would take me to another place. So I didn't have to deal with the present. And I guess because of that, it really helped my creative imagination, if you will. And then I took to writing poetry, singing. That was another safe zone. I would sit in my room and, you know, the old tape recorders that you put the tape in and you record a song from the radio, then you play it back, right? I immersed myself into song and then again, writing songs that, you know, kind of helped me. As I got older in high school, I just busied myself in my schoolwork. I was gifted academically. Um, At one time, they wanted me to skip a grade but I didn't want to leave my peers. So I stayed where I was, but I always got into something to keep me engaged. And of course, my upbringing with my grandmother, I have to say she was a strong-willed woman. She only had a sixth grade education, but she she was wealthier than I, I understood because she was a farmer. She had over hundred acres of land and cattle and all of that. So I learned how to do the farming thing. So that gave me independence. That gave me strengths because she instilled that part in me. And as I became an adult, I, my spirituality, my relationship with God, you know, I tapped into that and that helped me because before that, Harvey, I suppressed those memories in what I call my Pandora's box. And the only time I would fly open, if I watched the movie and it talked about domestic violence or molestation, it was like it would pop open. And then those emotions would flood out and I would get angry and and, and fearful. But then in my relationship with God, it helped me to deal with the issues. First of all, that it wasn't my fault. That I wasn't the reason my mother wasn't here. That was in God's plan. So now what am I going to do about that? And so it, that's that's kind of what helped me now. Am I fully over everything? No, but I am better. I am better than I was. Than I was and that's what kind of propelled me in ministry with women and in my career choice of being an educator and helping kids that were basically like me or went through those type of things. Was forgiveness a part of your journey at all? Oh, yes. That was the biggest part, learning to forgive, because I held so much anger and hatred for him for years. And I remember when I was doing my ministerial training, I was 33 years old, and, and God said, can I take your pain and use it for my glory? And I'm like, Daddy, we got to talk about this. I, I really don't talk about that type of stuff. I don't want to talk about it. He said, yeah, but I allowed it. I didn't allow it for you to hurt. I allowed it because you're not the only one. And so because of that, that helped me to break out of the box of that type of thing and to begin sharing and educating people about the first process is of forgiveness because I mean, I had to forgive him. And when I was like, okay, but why? You know what he did? He was like, well, he's my child too. And if he asked me to forgive him, I don't have any respect to person. This is just how God was talking to me. And so in 2015, I moved back to a place that I said I would never even wanted to stay longer than I had to. And the first thing that I did the first month back was connect with him with my stepfather and I don't know what he expected. And at the time, my husband, now he, we were engaged and he went with me. Harvey was like, I became that little girl all over again. I mean, it propelled me backwards, but then something inside of me, and I know it was God, gave me the strength to walk into his house because he didn't know what to expect. He shared with my brother later, my brother is his son. So, you know, there's there was always that tension there about that because I never wanted to make him feel like he had to choose between his father and me. And so when I went in and I told him, I said, I'm, I'm living here now. And I said, I want you to know that I forgive you. And then he was like, I'm going to tell you like I told your brother, you know, I can't take it back. I can't. And I stopped in mid sentence and I told him, I said, I'm not asking you. I know you can't take it back. But because I'm in ministry, I'm required by God to forgive as I want to be forgiven. And I, the look on his face was pure like, is she serious type thing? And that was the beginning process for me. Now, to me, it was the ultimate. I've had to forgive people before. I've, I've, my past relationship, my past marriage, I had situations where the women who had interfered God allowed me to forgive them. And I guess he was building me up for that moment there. So in doing that, it made it a little easier, but it didn't take it away. 
harm it didn't take it away. And I didn't realize that until I did a, a women's retreat last year about that forgiveness when we had to bring up and talk about those particular things. That anger came back. When I got the police report and I read uh, specifically about what took place, because I'd always just heard about it. But when I read the, the police report and the specifics of it, that anger rose up. So I knew the total forgiveness, the, the first process of the end, but not the final. So I began to work through that. And so I've gotten, gotten better. But yeah, forgiveness is key. I'm assuming he did go to jail. <sighs> he was sentenced to 20 years. He served five and got out on good behavior. And what and about being prosecuted for sexually assaulting you? They didn't bring that up. You have to understand in the seventies, they considered that a civil issue. Even I remember every time my mom would call the police or I remember once I called the police, we had just learned about how to dial 911 at our school. And the police officer came and he was like having a conversation with his friend. You know, he was like, well, one of you gotta go. And I mean, seeing me, I mean, he, this was a moment where he, my mother ran out on the street screaming for somebody to help her. He grabbed her by the hair with one hand and had a shotgun in the other and drug her back up the steps. And yet this, you know, officer say, well, you just leave for a few nights or whatever. So all of that content and stuff never got into the, the, her telling, sharing about that, I guess didn't make a difference. But about a year ago, I learned that she was an activist and that she was targeted by the KKK. And because of that, they visited our house. So I was wondering maybe did he do them a favor because she had death threats against her because of the activism she was doing in the community. So she must be shining down on you now, Shernita, and so proud of how you took that pain in order to help so many people. It's not just an interesting career you've had. It's so diversified. You spent many years in the field of education as a teacher. What made you leave that profession? Well, one was divorce. I went through a divorce in 2011. It was painful because it was almost 20 years. My children, my last two children had just graduated high school. And that was literally the last class because I taught in another county. And I ended up for the first time on a whim, moving to New York. You know, to me, it was, <laughs> I don't know, running from or running to, but I left and I began to, to get into the entertainment industry and kind of stayed there. Well, you co-authored a book entitled Born for This. It's an inspirational book designed to encourage women and men who may be emotionally stuck or trapped in a place where they can't move forward in their lives. What inspired your involvement in that project? That women's masterclass I took. Actually, the, the host of that masterclass is the main author, Quinona. And through that, that masterclass, she had, I call it the book whisperer, because she had a way of helping us to get things that were kind of internal out. And because of that, she was, she was already in the midst of doing that. And she said she was praying about the women that needed to go into that book. And she asked me about being one because she had heard about my story. And she said, Shanita, people need to hear your story. You can't hide it in your belly. Mind you, you know, I've written several and I've helped women to, to publish, you know. So it was like, okay, I'll do it, you know. So that was the first step with that, and then that pushed me to put my other book out. Well, your current book, Between the Legs of My Thoughts, and that's quite a title, is actually a multimedia project. It includes a CD of poetry and music based on the book. That was a brilliant idea, Shernita. I love it. As a, as a poet, as a creative, I'm always thinking outside the box. So after, you know, kind of holding those thoughts on the pages. And sometimes when I went back and read, I was like, I know that. You know, it's kind of amazing, but you hear a lot of spoken word poetry cafes and how they do it. And I thought it would be interesting if I did an audio version and the DVD version, kind of acting out what the, the poetry is, just to kind of give a visual to bring people in. Because it's not just something that I just wrote. You know, these were dark places. These were places that I was maybe in my highs or whatever, but 
you know, I know I'm not the only person that was feeling that way. So I, I, I love being able to, and I love to sing. So all of those type of media things go in. I, I wear a lot of hats. I guess God had to give me that to help me cope with what I went through. But I try to use all my gifts when I can. After the horrific trauma of your mother's murder, no one offered you any counseling. Is poetry and music a form of therapy for you? Um, yes. I'm what they call even brain. I'm analytical and creative. So the written part helps keep me grounded, you know, helps me put my thoughts, get it from the inside out. And the artistic part of, of drawing or painting and stuff, that immerses me. I have had times when I were, I was commissioned by schools or, or individuals to paint murals on the walls. And I would, you know, start after school because, of course, I would leave work, get myself, go to the school, probably about four o'clock in the evening when I get to the school. It would be midnight when <laughs> either my children or my, my husband at the time would come and say, hey, do you know what time it is? And I'm like, oh, wow. Because it, it again, it, it takes me to another place. So yes, that was my therapy that I believe God gave me. Now, Shernita, you come from the Deep South. Tell me about the realities of the racism that you've witnessed and encountered. Wow. So if I go back to my earliest beginnings, was as a little girl in that same town. And it's crazy, oddly enough, my best friends were white. And she was the first one that I heard the word nigger from. We were riding, I was riding her bike one day and on the sidewalk and she told me she was ready for her bike. I said, well, let me turn around and come back. And when I passed by her, she grabbed the back, cause back and then it had uh, 70 outfits with ties in the back. She grabbed the string and ripped it and said, nigger, get off my bike. And it was not only shocking, but it was hurtful at that time. And I remember throwing her bike down and fighting her. Yes, because I was angry. I'm like, how dare you? Another time I was visiting an uncle who was in the military and his kids and I were sitting in the car. Of course, we're a little older. And right next to our car were kids, the white kids that were in the car. And they began to make monkey sounds and call us nigger from the car. So we didn't hear a lot about that. I won't say that my mom sheltered me. We lived in an integrated neighborhood. Maybe that was the thing. I, I don't recall any other Blacks being in a neighborhood. Maybe that was one reason she was targeted. But I went to school with white kids. I, the first two boys that liked me were white. So I didn't see color. I was not raised to see color. I come from a multicultural family. My mother's uh, father descended from white slave master. My grandmother's, you know, white and, and Native American social. They never taught me that type of hatred, but I experienced it from, and then as I got older and even in high school in the town I lived in, we had a very controversial issue. And you all might have seen it in Just Mercy. That was my hometown that I was raised in, that that movie stemmed from. And because it's still rampant there, they didn't even consider filming taking place. Now, we've had, could keep in mind, the town of Monroeville is where the Killer Mockingbird was established. That's Harper Lee's hometown. You know, so it was, we had those plays. I took my student to that, you know, students to that, to that play. So engaging them is kind of in a, in a way where you know it's still there but they just used a different way to, to mask it. Before I went into teaching, I was a support personnel at the elementary school and I fought for the right for us to have a salary schedule, which of course I ended up getting threats from because they did not want to pay blacks the same as with whites. So yeah, that was, it. and I had, they ran my first lawyer off with threats. Uh, the second one said he was in such a way he got he broke out in hives and he asked me he said how can you deal with this he said, I can't believe they're still using this type of language today and so I've been a, been an advocate um, for civil liberties for quite some time because I believe everybody deserves the same rights as others. Well, what do you think white people most misunderstand about the realities of being black in America today? I think they misunderstand the fact that no matter what they do, it's not going to stop who we are. The more pressure that they put on, the more resilient we become. Most people say you fear what you don't know. 
You know, and it's a, we, can, we can point out a lot of things that people hate. And if you ask them why you hate it, I don't know, I just don't like it. You know, they can't even give reasoning. And, and, and my thing used to be, and I actually worked with the lady and she brought the question up, why is it that you all get offended about somebody white calling you nigger? But then you say nigger in your songs and you approach each other with, hey, my nigger. I said, well, for one, in the context that you say it is derogatory and meant to demean. I said, there have been people who have taken that word and took that power away from it. Because if you're not afraid of it, then it doesn't define you. I say, now, why do you not like someone black? Why are you afraid of it? You don't know me. If you cut me and if you cut yourself, the blood is going to be the same color. I can infuse you. You can infuse me. <laughs> You know, so that, what do you fear? And, and even today, you look at a lot of the white culture, they go in, they get tanned. So is it the color of our skin? Because you're tanning to get our complexion. You know, is it our, I used to be intimidated. You know, people used to tease me about my full lips. I love them. <laughs> I do too. But they're, they're using them. They're plumping their own lips up. So what is it that, that you fear from us? You know, even down to hair. I love in my family, we have long, thick hair. And at the time that when I used to perm, I remember my aunt, when I was 17, perm my hair, my grandmother had a fit, you know, but I went back natural, but, but you know, hair, we can do anything we want to, to it. So what is it that they're afraid of? You know, I, th I don't think they know. I think it's just the fear of the superiority. They like having that control. And so even from the films I've watched or, stories I've heard is just that fear of someone other than them being in control. I, and, and when I say them, I'm not talking about everybody because not everybody is racist in that manner. You have all cultures that have some type of disparity or racism themselves. But when you, a person who feels superior to another doesn't like to lose that type of control. It's such a sad and tragic way to live to think that there are different classes of people or that the word superiority even applies in the human relation context i just don't get it i never have tell me what's the era of the new black reconstruction what does that mean if you think about the, the original Re uh, reconstruction was after the civil war that was a time when you know they were trying to figure out what they were going to do with this and we were figuring out how we're going to do it it's crazy since the george floyd and the past four or five years especially the years of the trump era um it's like it resurfaced it in our town on one of the streets they painted black lives matter and they did it in multicultural with other countries that supported that movement well, when the, the news people would be down there talking about it and you could see the live feed, the hatred that was on that thread of, we just need another race war. We're gonna have a race war. You know, we're ready, we're getting our guns. They were buying guns up here so quick, it was making your head spin. And so I feel like we're going back into that, that same era of reconstruction that we have to define ourselves, that we have to get liberated again and i see a lot of us more of us now pooling together i mean there's strength in numbers we're stronger together i see a, a new black wall street emerging if you're familiar with the black wall street you know i i love the fact and it was just simply you know a community pouring back into the community and creating our own you know no matter what whatever group that's disparaged against if you push us hard enough We'll gear up on you and we'll create our own tables. We won't ask to get you your table. We'll create our own. And so we're, I feel like we're in that type of um, new era of, of Black Reconstruction. I think that's one of the most wonderful things I love about our mutual friend, Pichanda DuBose, who has created her own industry, really. Yeah. Yes, she has. Yes, she has. That's what I love about her. I'm her. I told her, I'm your biggest cheerleader, girl. I'm gonna be all the way up in the front saying, "Yeah." I love the way she tackles the social issues, and she makes it where you have to listen, you have to take note. And even though we, you know, there's some things that that 
we agree or disagree on, I don't make her feel, you know, any kind of way about that and, and, and vice versa, because we respect each other's, you know, decisions and, and, and opinions and ideas. But I love the way that she writes the hits. She has a compelling way to make you stop and think. I interviewed her, and this is the beginning of our friendship, when she was doing one of her stage plays in Atlanta and called The List. And just in sitting in on the table read, I was so drawn in. Keep in mind, I'm a wordsmith. You know, I'm, I'm drawn to other wordsmiths. The book, Between the Legs of My Thoughts. <laughs> I, I love to make you think, read one thing and you're thinking it's one thing, but then when you get to the other, it's like, oh, that's what she's talking about. So we have that in common that we love to go deep and make people think about, you know, things. My thing is, you have to make love to my mind first. If you can't meet me in the mental, we can't talk. You know, that's just, and, and, and not everybody's like that. So I understand, just like her, there are going to be some people who will get it and some who won't, you know, because it's not meant for everybody. But for those that it's meant for, you're, you can't help but be captivated by what she does. And I told her, I said, I'm going to be your protege since that. So <laughs> we well, click like that. I think you're both two shimmering towers of light and talent and creativity and artistry. And you draw people in because of the messages that you convey, which in my opinion are universal, Shernita. They are. They are. And, and that's, that's what I love about what I do because when I'm talking to people, if it's a, a woman's issue, I don't care what your color is. If you're dealing with that issue, I want to help. Even with our Domestic Violence Foundation, I understand women are not the only ones abused. Men are, you know, deal with domestic violence too. So we have to understand that we're all in this thing together. You know, we have to understand that we each, we may differ in ideals or the way we do things, but that does not make one better than the other. So, you presented a platform that reaches, you know, cross the lanes or cross lines or boundaries is what we should be doing. We should be connecting and, and, and looking at each other as not only Americans, but, you know, we're all on the same planet, Earth. <laughs> we're human. <laughs> Given what you've seen in the entertainment world, do you think that people of color are finally getting more opportunities in Hollywood? Yes, and, and no, and I, I have to kind of piggyback on, on what my friend that you, that you interviewed uh, recently, Lucia, said. We are moving forward more than before simply because, just like I said earlier, we're creating our own tapes. We're, we're, it, it used to be in Hollywood that if you didn't get a job there, you didn't work, or they could blackball you, and you couldn't get a storyline out. Now we have streaming apps. We have independent you know groups we have independent filmmakers so we're creative look at tyler perry you know he's he created a studio that he had more creative control versus hollywood telling him how to do his films i often tell p chan i said you're going to be the female tyler perry because she opens the door to create ways for other individuals that maybe some people would think they're washed out or they don't have enough skill or they're not well known enough you know and and so yeah hollywood is, is learning that they got to recognize us you know even down to the oscars they know if we take our business away you won't have a business so the doors are slowly opening they're opening to blacks and to women it's the power of, if you won't invite me to the table i'll build my own table and it will be better and bigger bigger exactly are you optimistic, Shernita, that life is going to get better for the Black community in America? I am. I am because it's historical fact that individuals or groups that are suppressed always rise above it or yeah. they're always educated. So it's an element. It's evolution. It's life. I see the things that are happening now. I see more of us pulling together. I see more people using their platforms to speak out. I just started a, um, on the, the clubhouse, started a clubhouse called Creatives for Change. 
And that's for any individual who is creative, who has a platform that they create, you are this as an actor, as a writer, a musician, and you want to tackle these social, you're not afraid to tackle these social issues, issues so that we can have the change that's needed. So yeah, I see us moving in a positive direction pretty fast. Do you love the fact that your creativity is an outlet for your activism and self-expression? Because you and Pichanda have that in common. Yes, I do. I, and the reason I do is because I believe that we were all birthed for purpose. We were all, we each have something we were specifically born to do. And I've been blessed with a lot of different gifts. I mean, I can write, I can create, I do art, I do graphics, I'm an educator, I do ministry. I know God can give me all those gifts to keep to myself. So I try to use them for helping others. And it just makes sense to me, and it, you know, because the gifts are not ours to keep to ourselves. You know, we got to be, a, if you're in a position to speak out, and I understand not everybody is going to be able to do that. In that lawsuit that I did against that county, um, we started out with a lot of people attending the meetings. And we were talking about secretaries, janitors, um, teachers aides, those type of things, bus drivers. And as it became more known that this was going to upheave some things in the community, they began to get threatened to say, you know, if you continue to do this, you're not going to have your job or the person that you got in your family is trying to get a job won't work. And, and they would one by one come to me and say, well, I can't come back. And my worst thing was, I understand that's your right. I'm going to go forward because it's not about me. It's bigger than me. You know, I'm getting ready to go into uh, the classroom. I don't want to leave, you know, my peers behind not, you know, and saying I don't care what they make because it's not me. I understand. And I told myself, I'm the only one left. That's fine. I said, but this is going to happen. And they have to understand that. When the threats will come to me, a prominent, and it's crazy, your own sometimes, a prominent Black person sent a message to tell me to stop what I was doing because I was going to set the county back 50 years. I say, well, you tell that prominent Black coward, I said, I'm not asking for anything that's not due to me or anybody else. So they can keep that. Do you think that people like you and I who have platforms should be sharing our audiences and our platforms with each other to embrace and support our missions? Of course. Again, like I said, stronger together. I think it's important that when you no matter what you're facing or I'm facing, if it's, if it's attacking our rights to equality, then yeah, we need to team up. We need to make sure that everyone knows that they have a right to live the lives that they want to live, how they want to live it, where they want to live it, doing what they want to do. That's just every human's God-given right. And the more that we join together, the better that will be because then it's not just this group or that group or the other groups. And the groups that we are all maybe have in common will see, well, hold up, there's too many of them, <laughs> you know, and it'll start making them change the way they think. That's my hope for that, is, which is why, again, going back to the domestic violence, I didn't want to just establish an a, a organization to just focus on women. I wanted to focus on women, men, and children because we all face similar things. So, yeah. I think it's important. And let's face it, domestic violence goes across all boundaries, economic, racial, socioeconomic, every, it doesn't matter where you're from, what color you are, what your ethnicity is, domestic violence exists everywhere. Exactly, exactly. exactly. And, and whether it's domestic violence, whether it's income disparity you know their women are fighting for the right to earn as much as men in some areas whether it's you know your your preferences of different things that we do in life you know we we deserve to want what we want and do what we want to do without someone threatening us so you know that's important now one of the things about you shanita that i admire so much is that you really value the importance of friendship and loyalty and mutual support you really truly embrace the concept that we have to help each other 
to help us reach and achieve our goals and our dreams. You really take your friendships very seriously, don't you? I do. I do because because I've experienced what disloyalty is. You know, I, my grandmother used to always, always say, treat people the way you want to be treated. That has always been my um, moral precipice in life. You know, I believe that if I want you to be a loyal friend to me, then I'm going to be a loyal one to you. And I've always told people the only person that can mess up that friendship is you, me, and God. So, you know, something happens, you know, it's not on me. And, and I, I used to get people, even early on in life, used to come to me and talk, about, talk to me about everything. I, I mean, I was a, the, the counselor before I was literally a counselor. And what I would get is when either friends or family members would say, well, why you didn't tell me if you knew? And my thing was, if someone confided to me about something, that's between me and them and God. You know, it's not my right to do that. So I demonstrated what loyalty means. I demonstrated that, you know, I'm that person you call at one or two o'clock in the morning and you need me, you know, I'm getting up out of bed and going to where you are. I try to be what I want to happen to me. That's important. We don't have enough of it. When Pichanda was on our show, she spoke about the multi-generational impact of slavery on Black people today, now. She advocates for reparations and compensation as a necessary and essential element of our healing as a society and as a way to have truth and reconciliation of our shared tragic history. Where do you stand on the issue of reparations? I agree. I agree that because the way things were taken away from our ancestors and that's trickled down even to us, we deserve to have the same opportunities. And a lot of the disparities we have is because financially, we can't get into that position or we don't have the means, some of us, to do certain things. So if you make it uh, known that if you do something, you'll have to pay. You know, the, the saying goes, if you do the crime, you do the time. But if you pay, you know, you do something, you know, you gotta pay for it. You have to, and, and a lot of times they say, well, that was my essence. That wasn't me. Why should I have to pay for something that happened? Because just like we're still paying for what happened to our ancestors, we bear those same burdens. I think it should be dubbed in the same you know, way in their culture. You know, you can't see because we're still, there's still repeating history. If you keep covering it up or pretending it didn't happen or saying we don't want to talk about it or I don't want to hear about that anymore, then you're given an opportunity for this to, for history to repeat. And it has repeated. So yes, I think if you dig in a person's pocket deep enough, it'll kind of change the mind about trying to do it again. Have you ever thought of a career in politics? <laughs> a couple of times. I've actually had people tell me, you need to do this, and you need to be on the city council. My, Biggest civic duty is being, uh, I work with voting. I'm a big advocate about voting rights. I worked at polls no matter where I lived, in Alabama, in New York, here, and I'm actually a clerk at a precinct. So I make sure that everybody's right to vote is not infringed upon. I've held local offices and things. And again, if I'm that person. If I'm there, you're going to see some change. And when I've had people to come, I'm like, you sure you want me? You sure? Because I'm going to do what I set out to do. <laughs> That's pretty refreshing, I think, for a politician. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and I think it because even when I talk to you know the, the political leaders here, community leaders, I tell them, you know, we put you in the office. Don't make us take you out. Because if you, you're not that you're there to do a job and speak up on behalf of your people, you can't be afraid to do that. Because some of them, and you said, "Well, I, I've tried, or I can only say so much." And I understand that some people, you know, try to suppress. But again, we're in the 21st century. There, you can expose that. That's no excuse. And I guess for me, I'm so passionate. I'm willing to do what it takes to, you know, get the job done. So if it means I'm not going to be popular with some of you, fine, but it's going to help somebody else. So I look forward to it. So maybe politics is in your future? The jury's out on that. 
<laughs> I want to ask you about your live stream podcast on the Clubhouse platform called The Coffee Shop Talk with Shernita, which I have really enjoyed. Can you tell us about the concept for this program and what your vision is for that show? My vision is that as a writer, as a celebrity journalist, whenever I interview individuals, and you know this, I always try to get the story that hasn't been told. I always try to bring, I use it also as a platform to bring to the surface social issues or things that are inspirational. So I'm using this and you think about coffee. Coffee is not just, if you're a real coffee drinker, you're not just drinking coffee in the morning. You're drinking coffee in the morning, in the afternoon, maybe at night, depending on what you put in it, that type of thing. So, you know, coffee is good any time of the day and it's stimulated. So I say, you know, stimulating conversation is good any time of the day. So I'm hoping on Clubhouse where I'm, I'm able to open up dialogue and conversation about things that matter. The young lady that I just had on the show on Monday, 5.33 GPA. Her mother, a retired vet, you know, she has an illness, she has lupus, and she's had financial struggles to get this child into a school. She graduated from high school with an associate's degree. And yet, here we are in this day and age where she can't, you know, they didn't consider the pandemic happening and help her with some scholarships and stuff that she, she should have had a full ride. I, I'm grateful to bring that type of thing. And, and when you don't know, you know, this is an opportunity to things that maybe other people didn't know, you know, what is out there. So I like to use my platform to not only bring things to the surface, but find solutions, determine how we can make, you know, help this to not happen again. And to just make sure the community knows that, hey, there's somebody out there that has your back. You know, when people ask me, what is Shernita Wigginswinder all about? In my opinion, if I had to put it into one sentence, you've dedicated your life to giving a voice to the voiceless. You want to empower people. That's how yes. I see you. Yes. Yes. That's to me what I was birthed for. That's what I feel I was birthed for. Um, and you're a deeply spiritual woman. You're an ordained pastor. How has faith guided you in your life journey? You talked about overcoming the trauma, your childhood trauma, which is unfathomable. But beyond that, your faith has really guided you through all of your life choices, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Have I always made the right choice? No, I'm human. I make mistakes just like the next. But what I love is the fact that when I read the word for myself, I don't take the context of what somebody else tells me God is saying. I take what my relationship with him is saying to me. I'm that person. And it's funny because I didn't run towards ministry. Some people live to be that. I ran from it. You know, I'm serious. You know, people prophesied it over my life. But when that door opened, I knew not to take it lightly. So even in my dark moments, the moments I didn't think I was worthy, I stepped away from my calling. And yet, God didn't step away from me. You know, everybody tries to make him out to be this big, vengeful God that hates this and hates that. And you'd be surprised at the thing that, I mean, he tells us, your ways are not my ways, nor your thoughts my thoughts. So if I'm thinking this is what he's like by what you tell me, then that makes that scripture untrue. Just to give an example, when I first got into ministry, uh, the... Uh, what they call Pentecostal. I don't know how familiar you are. They say you're not supposed to wear makeup, you're not supposed to wear jewelry, you're not supposed to wear dresses. And as you can tell, I'm a, I love fashion. I love looking my best. I love, you know, that that's me. I'm a creative. I'm artsy. And and you're glamorous. Yes, you know it. <laughs> but when I was told, I had, when I tried to do those things, I did not feel like me. And I was like, Oh, this is God. If this is what that's going to be about, I don't know if I can do that. And so I began to say, you know what? You tell me. I got into my word and I said, I want to get to know who you are. And as I read about him, Jesus was not popular. You know, they said negative stuff about him. They accused him of this and that. And yet he did 
what he did because that's what his father told him. So I said, if, if you tell me not to do something, if it feels uncomfortable to me, then I won't do it. And so, so I went back to wearing what I wanted to wear. I put my pants on, I put my makeup back on and I felt rejuvenated. So I tell people, it's not what you said, you know, about me that I should be. I'm going to let God. So yeah, he instructs me. If it's something that doesn't feel right, if he unctions me to do something, even if I don't do it, I know his voice. And so that is pinnacle for me. I don't even want to think about where I would be if I didn't have a relationship with God for myself. You created an organization in honor of your dear mom, Hattie Wiggins. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, the Hattie M. Wiggins, speaking of light, I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's a lighthouse behind me. From getting to know my mother from adult perspective, I realized that she inspired a lot of people. At her young age, she was only 22 when she was murdered. I'm a product of a teen mom. She was 15 when she had me. So looking at all the stuff she accomplished in her short time, to me, that was a beacon. And so I thought it necessary to establish an organization that would help guide people. I feel like if she had that type of thing, because in the 70s, there was no domestic violence organization in that area. And so I want to be that platform of when someone is going through something, they not only get assistance, but they get help to come out of that and, and not stay in. Because most women, and I, I've dealt with domestic violence. I've been married two times before, and both of them ended primarily because of that type of behavior, verbal and physical abuse. And I realized, because I do have a communication with both exes that it wasn't so much them as it was what they went through in their childhood. So I wanted to understand not only the victims, but those that are, you know, projecting this type of harm. A lot of them, it's mental issues, it's psychological issues, you know, psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissism, you know, any of those things could play a part. So the organization I not only want to reach the victims and those inflicting the pain, but even those that are just like my brother and I was, were left as victims as well as children. You know, so the or it, that's that's what we want to encompass. And I'm using the arts to do so. She was an art. She was a creative person. She passed on her creative ability to draw and to write and to sing to me and my brother. So how more fitting than to use the arts to help people to heal through it. And that's what I do with that organization. One of the things I admire so much about you, Shernita, is your optimism, your confidence, your self-esteem. You truly believe in yourself and in your destiny, don't you? I do. I do. I feel if you're not your own biggest cheerleader, then how can you expect anybody else to support you if you don't support yourself? A lot of that self-esteem came from, again, my mother and her remembering her love and her nurturing, my grandmother that instilled in me that I, there was nothing that I couldn't do. There were a lot of things that I dealt with other than the molestation and domestic violence. And in that span of my lifetime, you know, I've, I've come to, to learn that I can accomplish anything if I set my mind to it. So... You know, I'm, I'm not going to let anybody tear me down or make me feel like I'm inferior. I know what I'm capable of. You've spent a lot of time thinking and writing and speaking about the importance of discovering what our purpose is on this planet. What do you say to people who just can't seem to figure out their purpose? Huh. It's interesting you said that. I actually hosted a group, started, I started January the 11th and did it about four months and that's what it was it was called daughters of purpose and what i tell people usually your purpose is something that you don't even think is a purpose you don't even think it's something significant because you do it naturally or you've always felt like there was something you should be doing so i try to see myself as someone who helps people to birth their purpose and that just simply means to, to determine what it is if you don't know, we have in our conversations, I 
just have a spiritual ability to see that in someone. I can see what it is that God wants to do through them. And as we have conversations, the light bulb comes on. And then I usually help, you know, either cultivate it or guide it or connect. I love making connections with one individual to another. I don't have any jealousy in me because God has gifted me so well that I can do so much. So I don't even mind helping people who do what I do. I don't mind connecting. I think when you're together, when you make connections, divine connections, you can get a lot accomplished. And when you connect your purpose to someone else's, then it makes it easy to find those individuals that either do what you do or should be because, you know, you can't help somebody do something that you're not doing. So usually the people I end up helping to find their purpose is usually centered in or around what it is that I do. So if you could go back and talk to the 10 year old Shernita, what would you say to her? <laughs> oh, the 10 year old one. You're gonna lose the weight, and even if you don't, it's okay. You know, you're still a beautiful person. Being by yourself is not a punishment. It's gonna prepare you for those moments when you have to walk things out by yourself. And one day you're gonna actually have the life that you've always imagined. I think that's a good message. And I hope that that 10 year old Shanita that's still inside you who has evolved into the beautiful woman that you are now inside and out still feels whole, you know? Yes. I always think there's always going to be something left inside of us to push us and to make us, you know, have to pray or cry out to God. And so I'm okay with that. I'm learning to take that, that pain or whatever this, the remnants are and put it to paper or put it to film now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Matter of fact, I am okay. How about that? <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Not, not only that, I think the best is yet to come. Uh, I got to say, Shernita, having yes. you appear on our show has been absolutely magical. You inspire me every day because you actually walk the talk. I, I just wish you the best of luck with all your endeavors. I hope you know you're welcome on our show anytime. I love following your career with great interest and pride and love. Yes, same here. I love you too. Mwah! Smiling good to see you. So yeah, we got to make this a common thing. I might just have to hop on for something else to bring you in on something. <laughs> I think we just might have to do a little co-hosting. What do you think of that? Hey, I like that. Can they handle it? You can they handle us? <laughs> You know, you're the first interviewer that I've interviewed. It's a little intimidating. Ooh. Well, they better bring it because I got it. <laughs> thank you so I much for being heart. on our show, Shanita. And I thank you for having me. I really appreciate it because, you know, hey, situations like this, and you can get two individuals that are passionate about making uh, things happen and change. There's nothing we can't do. And I'm, I'm just excited about the opportunity. Our guest has been the scintillating author, entrepreneur, and talk show host, Shernita Wiggins-Winder. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.